Welcome to today's program titled Equal Payday 2021, U.S. and Global Outlook and Trends. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials along with the CLE attendance form will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker, Christine Hendrickson. Christine, please go ahead. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so thrilled to see so many of you join us um, on today, Equal Pay Day 2021. My name is Christine Hendrickson, and I am the co-chair of CIFAR's Pay Equity Group, along with my partner, Annette Tymon. Equal Pay Day at CIFAR, and really honestly, the lead up to it, is always a time of just real deep reflection as we think about all that has changed over the previous year and what we see on the horizon. Truly every year, it looks a little bit different as the, as the landscape shifts, um, but no more so than in the, in the last year um, with both the pandemic and the murder of George Floyd having shifted both the world and also the pay equity la landscape. So today I wanted to introduce you first to my colleagues and then we collectively wanted to share with you some trends that we're seeing on the pay equity landscape, many of which were impacted of the events um, by the events of, of 2020. So first I wanted to introduce my partner, um, Marjorie Culver. Marjorie sits in our, in our New York office um, and she's a core member of our pay equity group. She really leads the charge on the global pay equity work that we do, that we do at CIFARS and we partner very closely together on that work. She's also a leader on the firm's international employment law team, as is our colleague, Jeremy, who like Mar Marjorie sits in our New York office. Um, Jeremy really did the laboring or on one of our three publications, which we're putting out today, which is our brand new first annual global pay equity desktop reference. So I'm really thrilled um, to have Jeremy joining us along with, with Marjorie um, to show and to talk through kind of what we're seeing on the global front, because that's really where we're seeing so many changes um, on pay equity, especially in this last year. We're also joined by, by our colleague, Matt Gagnon. Matt is the author of our second Developments in Equal Pay Litigation Guide. Um, he, Matt is a core member of, also is a core member of our firm's pay equity group. He also sits within our complex litigation group. So Matt brings to the table just significant amounts of experience in pay equity litigation, um, where his practice focuses on defending employers in class and collective actions under state and federal laws, but including the Federal Equal Pay Act and the compensation um, discrimination um, portions of, of Title VII. So we're really thrilled to have Matt um, here with us again to talk through the, um, the developments in equal pay litigation. Um, it's, a, it's a huge area. So really, what are we seeing um, when we look at 20, when we look back at 2020, and then really what we look as we move forward into 2021 and beyond is what is outlined on the next slide. So the first thing that we're seeing is an acceleration of employer focus on equal pay. This has been remarkable to us. Um, many employers have really invested in addressing issues of systemic inequity and racism and have focused and redoubled their focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. The amount and the number, the sheer volume of the number of employers that have never undertaken a pay equity audit and have chosen to do so in 2020 and 2021 is truly remarkable. Um, and it's been our honor to stand with you as you take that the steps, some of you for, 
for, for many, many years have undertaken pay equity audits. Others are brand new to this space, but it's been really remarkable um, to see the number uh, of employers that have really invested in looking at pay equity within their organizations. We think that this will also support efforts in the post-COVID world. Many workers left the workforce due to the pandemic, many of them black and brown um, females, and we, will ho we hope that they all return in droves um, as we um, continue to vaccinate and are, and are hopefully moving, moving beyond the, the darkest hours of the pandemic. As, but this is really a, a, a huge opportunity for employers. Setting starting pay, that initial pay decision, is the most important pay decision that you make in the course of an, in an employee's entire career. And so making that decision and making that in a really mindful way um, and ensuring that new and returning hires are placed and paid equitably will be really critical for employers who are committed to equal pay. So we see that um, as an opportunity in 2021. We also see more pay reporting laws and disclosure requirements, both within the US and around the globe as, Mar as Marjorie and Jeremy and I will discuss in this webinar. And then lastly, a lot more litigation. We still see and have seen an increase in litigation under the federal Equal Pay Act and under the analogous state laws with a focus on those state law claims. Um, and Matt will walk us through all of those developments. So Cyparth today on the next slide, we, I mentioned, um, I kind of mentioned uh, a bit that we have three new resources available. We're really pleased today that Cypher's Pay Equity Group is publishing um, three different resources. You can see on this slide um, that we're, we're publishing an update to our 50 state pay equity reference in the US. Um, Matt's Developments in Equal Pay Litigation is also being updated and brand new this year um, is the Global Pay Equity Desktop Reference. And so all of these materials are now available on the CyPARF website. If you look under my name and if you look under the, the Horizon um, uh, alert that went out today, they're all linked there, but we're going to be providing them to everyone who's on the, on the call and, and who signed up for the webinar as well. So again, we're really pleased that you joined us and, and thank you so much. And I'm gonna now turn this over to Marjorie to begin the discussion about the global pay reporting requirements and trends that we're seeing around the world. So with this, up to, over to you, Marjorie. Thanks, Christine, and welcome everyone. We're happy to be here today and talk about our work that we do with our global pay equity group. Uh, our team, Jeremy and I, and the rest of our team, we focus on international employment issues, employment, multi-country employment issues outside the U.S. primarily. And so we're happy to partner with Christine and, and our whole pay equity team on how to implement a pay equity strategy globally. Uh, we have capabilities in all our offices, London, Hong Kong, uh, the U.S., Australia, China. Uh, and today we're going to share with you the trends that we're seeing, but also how pay equity issues differ from country to country, sort of what is the flavor of pay equity in, in some of these countries. So I want to start by just giving you the, the list of some of the pay equity requirements and, and the buckets that they fall into. You have requirements in some countries to self audit. You have some countries that require disclosure, and that disclosure can be to employees, to the government, uh, publicly. Uh, all of these vary depending on the size. Uh, another type of disclosure requirement is to works councils or unions, um, and, and not publicly. And I, you know, I, I also want to differentiate pay equity, when we talk about pay equity and today, we're talking about gender pay equity and reporting requirements. And that's mostly where the reporting is. But some countries have pay equity laws that are really about someone works in the same job, someone else in the same job, same pay. It doesn't matter the gender, it doesn't matter if they fall into a protected category. That's outside the scope of what we're talking to about today, but it is important when talking about pay equity that you understand that there is that other flavor of pay equity law out there. 
Uh, so what we do when we advise on pay equity requirements is assist uh, our pay global pay equity team with the considerable uh, talents they have at doing economic analysis. And we work with them to help apply it in the various countries uh, and meet those requirements so that there's real uh, efficiency in the work that's done. And we do this by getting an understanding of, you know, what type of reporting requirements, what they have to look like, uh, what the environment is there as far as what, what data uh, needs to be collected and what you want the pay equity analysis to show in the reporting. As I mentioned, it's different if you report to the union, it's different if you report to the government. Uh, we also advise on the privacy issues outside the US that are implicated by the, the enormous transfer of data in order to do these analyses. Uh, another uh, aspect of our practice is advising on the collective employee issues that arise in pay equity. So if you have to report to a union, if you have to negotiate with a works council regarding an undertaking a pay equity analysis or presenting results. Another aspect of our work uh, that differs from country to country is how do we do this? How do we do this analysis? How do we advise on risk? How do we advise on mitigation strategies within the framework of legal privilege, which varies from country to country? So we provide a, a number of um, ways to mitigate and address risk, but we also advise companies on how to maintain privilege. So um, I am going to leave this with Jeremy now to talk about the trends uh, because we are we have some time constraints. So we're going to go to Jeremy and he's going to talk about our what we're seeing out there. Great. Thanks, Marjorie. I appreciate it very much and happy to be with everybody today. Um, you know, when we talk about the last year, obviously, uh, a lot of the focus uh, has been on the pandemic um, and 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 how that impacted the workplace. Um, so I'll get to that in a bit. And I think that is one of the hot trends we're seeing, but, but as Marjorie just alluded to, um, it, one of the biggest trends we've seen so far this year, as far as. And that's outlined on the um, next slide, I think. And that, that's right. That's right. And one of the, one of the, one of the biggest trends, yeah, here we go. Um, that's one of the biggest trends we're seeing so far this year is, um, increasing as Marjorie alluded to the, the, the requirement that you have to report externally. Um, to the government, to uh, other regulators, um, as opposed to what Marjorie alluded to, which was the internal disclosures to be it employees, uh, works councils, um, and other internal stakeholders. And, and obviously the, 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 the purpose of that is to ensure that we have uh, companies being publicly accountable uh, as well as internally accountable. It, it creates a greater, uh, I think, pressure for companies to, to have to comply uh, with with obligations, if there's a public reporting requirement, and so we're seeing that happen uh, slowly but surely in in several countries. Um, and we'll talk about in a moment one of the bigger initiatives that just came out of the EU, where a central part of that proposed directive is is the public disclosure requirement. Um, another trend we're seeing, uh, and this has been I think the case uh, for several years now, but but uh, particularly when we were doing the analysis. In preparing our global desktop reference, which I'll talk about in a second as well, uh, these these sort of global pay equity reporting laws, uh, be it internal disclosures or external disclosures, tend to be uh, regional and where where they're hot, where they're, this is a hot issue. So, just looking at it geographically, the U.S. and and the EU region tend to be the places where we're seeing a lot of these laws either already on the books or starting to crop up. Uh, whereas in places like Latin America and, and Asia PAC, uh, with sort of the exception of Australia uh, and maybe New Zealand, um, we're not we're not really seeing a ton of uh, a ton of pay equity reporting laws. Now, one of the important things Marjorie said, that's not to say there aren't laws on the books about pay equity in general, right? So you still may have an obligation, of course, to not discriminate or to pay equal pay for equal work if somebody's in a role. But when we talk about the obligation for public reporting, um, that's what really what we're seeing as a regional sort of uh, phenomenon. It, it hasn't really taken hold in, in as I mentioned, LATAM and, and, and Asia PAC, as opposed to EU and the US. Um, 
as I started at the outset of the slide, COVID-19 uh, has had an impact on this. Christine alluded to it earlier um, as far as in the U.S., but obviously it's a pandemic, so it's, it's a global issue. Um, and so it's impacted, I think, a lot of the focus. This, this, this area of, of, uh, of uh, I think, legislation with, with pay equity reporting was really starting to heat up toward the end of 2019 and beginning of 2020. We saw several countries um, in the EU uh, in particular, start to really focus on this. And then, of course, the pandemic hit, and I think a lot of the regulators and legislation uh, that was in the works sort of stalled. Um, Ireland is a place, for example, where there was, uh, where there's legislation pending, but it hasn't really gotten to uh, be uh, enacted yet because we haven't had uh, a lot of focus on, you know, pay equity, which is a shame, of course. Um, but just, I think, you know, the governments were, were of course, attuned to the fact that employers had other you know, really important issues to deal with given the pandemic. So it's, I think COVID, as we start to work our way out of COVID, we're going to start to see, again, back to where we were in 2019 and 2020, um, a greater focus on, on you know, these, uh, these measures uh, that were previously uh, in the works. Um, training and data collection, uh, worse, I think, in the U.S. in particular, um, and Christine obviously will speak to this in a little bit, but, but, as is the case in the U.S., internationally, we're also seeing, uh, especially with multinationals, the desire to do two things. One, train your workforces on gender pay equity and gender equity issues in general in the workplace. Um, of course, the more educated your workforce is about these issues, the better off you will be, I think, uh, as far as meeting the challenges and, and the needs of, of equity in the workplace, uh, both as a matter of pay equity and gender equity in general. Um, and then data collection, and we, we've dealt with a lot of questions in the, over the last year um, from employers, not just on the pay equity side, but in general, you know, as a result of, I think, wanting to foster a greater, uh, a greater uh, sense of equality in the workplace uh, in, in the gender pay equity sense, but, but in, in the broader sense as well. And employers want to know what kind of data they can collect um, to track this and measure this, both as a matter of public reporting and for their own internal uh, internal needs. Um, and of course, there's data privacy issues that go into that, which is sort of beyond the scope of, of today's topic. Uh, but but um, it's something that I think go part and parcel with this idea of how are we measuring pay equity uh, and how are we disclosing it and reporting it and what are companies' obligations vis-a-vis uh, -vis third parties and internal stakeholders. Um, and the last, one of the last trends that we're seeing uh, that I want to mention today, of course, um, is the the internal stakeholder and external stakeholder interest in pay equity. Uh, it's no surprise as we've seen things like Me Too movement um, and, and other legislative efforts uh, or, or, or topics in the workplace come up that have to do with pay equity. Um, regulators are taking an interest in this. Um, investors are taking an interest in this. Uh, we have clients who have taken an interest in this and they all want to see, I think, companies implementing pay equity and, and doing what they can to foster a greater sense of equality in the gender pay gap in the workplace. Um, one of the things in particular that has been interesting, I think, is investors in companies in particular are starting to look at uh, so-called ESG criteria, so environmental, uh, social, and governance criteria um, as a means of determining whether to invest in a company. And so if your company is not doing what it needs to be doing or isn't seen as a thought leader in gender pay equity, uh, or, or up on, you know, the latest, um, we've seen that investors are factoring that into their evaluation as to how they invest in companies. Um, I also think, and this is more of a U.S. issue, but it also is starting to be uh, a factor in the EU, um, these sort of criteria, the ES and G criteria that I mentioned, um, there may start to be disclosure requirements uh, as we go forward in the future where the government requires as part of annual reports to the government or, or if you're publicly traded, um, some sort of obligation to disclose what you're doing on, on pay equity and, and pay equity reporting. And so that's gonna be a space to watch as we go forward, um, but it's certainly, uh, it's certainly gonna be an interesting development uh, as, we, as we move forward as, as far as what you have to do um, in, in your reporting for, for all these various different stakeholders that have an interest in this area. So if we, if we go to our next slide, um, so, so this this slide uh, showing sort of the upshot of what what we sort of gleaned at a at a fifty thousand foot level from the 
from the uh, pay equity uh, desktop reference guide that we prepared. Um, I think, you know, it, we surveyed over, over 60 countries, as you can see, 64. And importantly, 33% of the countries we surveyed um, had some sort of pay equity reporting uh, requirement. And again, I want to make sure we're clear. This is, these are, these are countries that had the 21 of the 64 are countries that had some sort of reporting requirement or disclosure requirement, either internally to employees, works councils, or other employee representatives, or to government and, and other public, uh, public entities, such as regulators, et cetera, et cetera. So that is not to say that there, again, there are not, there may be, uh, in many, and in many countries there are, pay equity uh, equality laws in the sense that, you know, equal pay for equal work. Um, but we have seen uh, that there are several countries, again, of the, of the major countries we, we surveyed uh, and, and looked at, 33% had some sort of pay equity reporting law. And a lot of those requirements come up in the, in the beginning of each year. So as an employer, um, if you're doing this already uh, and you're, you know, you're fully attuned to the requirements in, in the countries you operate in, Great, keep at it. That's a good thing, of course. Um, but if if you're if you haven't really looked at this uh, as a as an employer yet, um, it, it it is worth it is worth doing and spending the time um, because I think you know as we said a lot of a lot of different countries, especially for multinationals, do have these requirements and they crop up pretty quickly um, each year. And, and so to know those and to be aware of those, um, you know, is is an important thing uh, as far as compliance. And, and again, I think. One of the other things we talk about uh, is this becoming a sort of an important issue for for uh, uh, employee uh, retention and attracting talent. Um, I think a lot of employers um, are starting to realize that you know it, this matters to people who are applying to jobs, especially younger candidates um, who are who are sort of coming into the workforce with this being at the forefront of their mind and, and much more socially attuned to issues. So, um, general, just you know. If, you, if you're not looking at this already, worth doing. Um, you know, our, our, our guide that we prepared is, is a helpful tool to give you a high level view and uh, what the requirements are and the timing requirements and, and uh, recommend that everybody, you know, start looking at this if they're not doing so already. And uh, that would be the next slide. So these are just some of the some of the requirements that that we have that are um, around the world as examples of these pay reporting requirements. As you can see, they're really different in every single jurisdiction um, where we're seeing in some places just looking at medians, in other places doing a much more detailed view. So that every every reporting requirement is really is really quite different. Um, and I think on the next slide, Jeremy was going to talk about. Um, really, sure. a major yeah. modification so, so, in the. That's right. Thanks, Christine. So, so in the last, in the last, uh, basically the last month or so, um, the the EU uh, Commission put out a a tra pay transparency directive, which. Um, if, if it is, and this again, this is a, this is a proposed directive. It has not been implemented yet. Um, but given the way things are trending, I think it is reasonable to expect that this would potentially become adopted, um, in, in the not too distant future, which I'll talk about in a second, but, but it is, it's a, it's a, it would standardize sort of a requirement uh, across the EU to have a pay equity reporting obligation. So, um, you know, it would require all EU employers to take various measures to help foster gender pay equity, um, specifically things like providing initial salary or salary range information to job applicant, job applicants, excuse me, before interviewing. Um, we've seen that in some, just to draw an analogy, we've seen that now in, in some, um, in some U.S. places and, and states. Um, it would prohibit employers from asking job applicants about salary history. Um, again, that's, that's, we've seen a big trend in the U.S. Many states uh, now have laws in the books that, that don't allow that. Um, and the EU, that's not really been the case so far. Um, uh, several EU countries have adopted, uh, you know, the pay equity reporting laws, but there hasn't necessarily been that rule, which sort of, you know, helps stop the, the uh, continuous use or, or, or reliance on, on figures that may be gender skewed toward, toward furthering a pay gap as opposed to fostering equality 
since it's based on what we already know is probably a somewhat large gap between male and female uh, employees in the workforce. And so that is an important, I think, tool uh, that this that this proposal uh, that the EU Commission has put forward uh, is going to potentially implement. Um, and then there's other cases where if there's a gap of at least 5% and the employer cannot justify um, certain neutral factors as to why there's a gap of at least 5%, uh, the employer is going to have to carry out a pay assessment potentially in cooperation with workers' representatives. And so, you know, there, there is, uh, there's some teeth to this. Uh, it's not just going to be, you know, I think uh, if it goes into effect, something where employers can sort of just do an internal sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, internal report, there's going to be some potential uh, public reporting aspects to this um, as well. And so it, this bears watching, if, again, if, if, if we've not, um, if you're not really working in this space yet as an employer, uh, and you haven't done a pay equity uh, assessment of where you're operating and whether reporting is required, um, certainly recommend doing so, especially because if this if this is adopted in the future in the EU, there's going to be there's going to be requirements um, that are going to apply throughout the the EU. And so, if you have a country that already has a law on the books um, and you're operating there, this would further um, bolster what is already on the books. And in other countries, if there's not, uh, in, if it is adopted, all 27 EU member states would be required um, to have this. Uh, proposal implemented, and so it's going to be a heavy lift for a lot of countries if if uh, this is if this does go into effect, and consequently for employers in those countries will also need to become compliant. All of this is to say this is not happening tomorrow. Um, you know, again, I think with what's going on in the world right now, um, EU generally uh, I think has still really focusing on the pandemic effort uh, and getting getting uh, things up and running like they were pre-COVID. Um, but, but again, if, if we do see this come into play, I think sometime in the next three, three ish years would probably be the time frame we're looking at. So bears watching this space. This will be debated. I'm sure as, as we move forward, but, but this is going to be uh, probably a hot button issue, especially for, for, uh, companies in the EU, uh, and, and those doing business there. And here's to Christine, talk about some major changes to the U S pay equity landscape. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jeremy. You know, I think that one of the things that will hopefully have really uh, that you'll have really seen is that we really are in a global world on pay equity. That it used to be, you know, two years ago on Equal Pay Day, we were kind of talking about the fact that the there were two different approaches. The approach that the U.S. was taking that was really focused on you know, modifications to the pay laws and salary history ban laws, and then where the rest of the world was going, which looked a lot around transparency and reporting requirements. I think that what you likely have seen from the from everything that Jeremy talked through and then the spot that I wanted to talk through on the next slide and beyond is the fact that we're seeing these trends move between countries. So you, you, Jeremy mentioned that the salary history ban, which was really hot in the US over the last couple of years um, with jurisdictions adopting um, requirements that you can't ask um, about prior pay. And that's all outlined in our 50 state survey. We kind of track all of, all of those state requirements. Um, but we hadn't seen it in the rest of the world. Now we're seeing that maybe that will be something that the EU is adopting. Um, on the other hand, the pay scale disclosure requirements, um, which is something that first happened in the United States, we'll talk about that. Now the EU may adopt it. And then on the other hand, you know, there's been all of this reporting, a remarkable 33% of countries with reporting laws. I think that that's remarkable. Um, we're seeing that same trend now happening in, within the US. Um, both at the state level and potentially more federal action on equal pay that we're going to be um, talking about in just a moment. Okay, so on the next slide, I wanted to first talk about the pay scale disclosure requirements. So pay scale disclosure requirements, what is this? The pay scale disclosure requirements require that employers provide job applicants, or in some cases we'll see, 
actually employees. Um, the pay scale, so the range of pay, and potentially in some in some areas like in Colorado, um, other components of pay and benefits um, for the role that they're that they're applying for. So on the next slide, you can see what is what is required. Right now, we're seeing these requirements in California, in Colorado, in Maryland, in two cities in Ohio, and then in Washington state. Um, these laws differ both in terms of who need to whom you need to provide the information. So, for example, in California, in Maryland, in Toledo, in Cincinnati, Ohio, you're providing that information to applicants. Um, in Washington state, you're providing that information to both applicants and employees. And that similar requirement is true in Colorado. Um, the timing of that is also different. Kind of the big news this year um, was the Colorado Equal Pay Act, which went into effect on January 1st. Now the Colorado law requires that for every single job that you're posting in Colorado, or for remote roles that could be performed in Colorado, you have to actually put the pay scale and then a general description of the benefits and a general description with about the other forms of compensation that are available on the actual job posting. I mean, and that is huge news. Um, and and it, it's really had significant, significant um, um, impact on employers who are now really rethinking transparency um, around, around pay. And as Jeremy indicated, this is something that may also happen in the EU. So right now we're not seeing it as, you know, kind of state, when the salary history ban started, it was like, they went boom, 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 boom. They passed really quickly. Right now, we're not seeing that same, um, we're not seeing that pay scale disclosure requirement on the actual job description as something that's required in other places in the US, but it may be something that's required outside of the US and the EU. And so transparency is gonna be a major theme um, that you really should start thinking about now because it's gonna take a very long time to get to a spot um, that you would feel comfortable likely um, having that information because transparency around pay has major implications, both from a competitive market standpoint. So you're showing that that information will be available not only to applicants, but of course to, to competitors who may see that information um, from a risk standpoint, um, where an employee may say, wait, wait a minute, I'm actually below, below the range or lower in the range, um, which can have both employee morale and then also retention um, implications. So I think that employers should begin the process of thinking, you know, what would I need to do if we were going to have to have pay scales on all job postings in the future? Um, what would that look like? And a lot of that is usually looking at, like, do you have pay ranges? And are those, are people within the ranges? And are you um, restraining pay as people are reaching the top end of the ranges? Um, and are you gonna, do you have a plan for beginning to, to have those discussions? So that just may be something that you want to begin thinking about because um, it, my experience is that it takes employers, you know, at least a couple of years to get into a position that they would feel comfortable um, having that information. And so just kind of seeing on the horizon that this may be something that is going to come sooner rather than later um, if the EU goes in that direction. And as we're seeing, we have this kind of cross pollination happening around the globe. So if something's happening in the EU, it may be picked up in more states or even at the even at the federal level within the US, um, although we're not seeing that right this second. Um, so again, just something to think about because we think that these pay scale disclosure laws um, and all of the background that needs to be done to get into a position um, of being able to disclose that information is going to be a big trend um, on a on a go forward basis. The 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 next trend that we're seeing on the uh, on this slide is a trend towards pay reporting in the U.S. So um, as Jeremy mentioned, there are definitely calls for greater transparency around pay equity. Um, and as Jeremy mentioned, a lot of this is happening with shareholders, um, with employee resource groups, with employees asking for more information around that. And in fact, CIFAR just launched a new ESG 
practice group. Um, and there, because we're seeing so many requests around what can you say, what are all of the securities implications around that, um, because it is becoming a very big deal um, globally and also, and also within the US. Um, one thing that has fed that we're beginning to see that has been a trend, um, as, as Jeremy indicated, kind of a, around the globe is around paid reporting. So as many of you know, the EEOC required that employers provide um, pay information under the Obama administration. That was then rescinded by the Trump administration, reinstated through a lawsuit, um, and then ultimately kind of abandoned by the Trump administration that employers would have to file that pay at the federal level with that EEO1 component to report. Well, some of the states and particularly California and breaking news as of yesterday, Illinois will require that you file pay reports um, that are similar in many ways um, with some differences um, to what we were seeing under the component two report. It's also possible that there will be a reinstatement or a reimagining of the federal EEO1 um, kind of EEO1 like pay report at the federal level. Um, and we want to, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So I just wanted to mention kind of what is going on in California, um, and then we'll talk about Illinois. Okay, so in California. So at the end of this month, just a couple of days away on March 31st, there's the first reporting requirement of California's paid data report. If you are seeing that for the first time, or if you're you like many of our clients are just like mashing their way through all of the data in order to file that, and you don't think that you'll meet that March 31st deadline, there is a deferral available that will give employers until April 30th. And if you look at that, if you click that link below, or if you um, you know look for that link below uh, on the DFEH website, you'll see you can request a deferral request um, electronically on there that gives employers until April 30th to file um, those pay reports. So what are those pay reports and who has to file them? So any employer who's subject to the EEO1 filing requirements that has at least 100 employees nationally across the US will be required to file the EEO, the, the California pay report if they have any, even one employee that is either living in California, so a remote employee living in California, or someone who is reporting into a California office. So living in or reporting into California, those employees and those employees only are required to be reported on the California pay data report. Now you can, you're allowed to include all employees, but you're not required to. And I, don't know why, we, and yeah, so at any rate, the, the employers are, you're required to report just for those California employees that are actually sitting in California, or even if you had someone that was like remote in New York that's reporting into an office in, in California, then those employees would also need to be counted um, on the pay report. In many ways, it's very similar to the component two report. But there are these key differences, which is make it like mind blowingly difficult to, to um, gather the data in some ways. So on the EEO1 pay report, you had to report the box two, um, the W2 box uh, box two earnings. Here you're you're actually reporting the box five earnings. So you're looking at a different, a different data, data point. Also, under the EEOC's guidelines, you were reporting on hours paid, even if those hours were not worked. Uh, excuse me, I said that opposite. Under, under the EEO1, you were not including hours paid even if they weren't worked. So if someone was on a leave of absence, they were being paid for those hours, for example, as a paid leave, um, you would not count those hours when you're collecting the, the, the number of hours worked. In the, now under the California report, you actually have to include those hours as well. And then another big deal difference is that you have to um, you have to have um, a you have to report on separate reports for each legal entity. So there's more information in FAQs available there. Um, we're always here to answer any questions that you may have on that. 
um, and on to talk a, a little bit about Illinois. Okay, so Illinois, this is brand new as of yesterday, and it says coming as of 2023, and that's true, but it probably really should say 2023 and 2024, because some of the requirements are effective in 2023, the requirement that you have to file um, your EEO1 that would be actually published, um, and then some of these other pay requirements go into effect in 2024, so it's a little bit of a mix. But what is the Illinois law? So it's, a, it's similar, sort of, to the California law um, in that you have to, employees with more than 100 employees have to, to file equal pay reports, but it comes with a twist. So the twist is that you also have to certify compliance with the equal pay laws. Um, and that certification has kind of multiple requirements on, on what, you, what you're required to certify but you're required to certify things like um, that you are in compliance with Title VII and the Equal Pay Act and the Illinois Human Rights Act. You also, and this is a big one, have to say that the average compensation for your female and minority employees is not consistently below the average compensation um, for male and non-minority employees within each of the major EEO1 job groups. Um, so that would suggest that you're going to have to be doing some statistical analysis um, to, an, to evaluate whether or not that's true or not. Um, it says that you can take into account things like length of service, jobs, experience, effort, responsibility, working conditions, but this is going to require that Illinois employers or employers that have Illinois employees are going to need to be able to do an actual pay analysis to be able to, to certify where this is coming. There's other, there's other certification requirements. You're also going to have to file your EEO ones, the actual EEO ones with the state, but unlike the federal EEO ones, which are not released by the EEOC and only released by the OFCCP, if there is a, um, if there is a, a FOIA request, these ones are publicly available and the civil penalties extend to 1% of the in business's gross profit. So it's a big, big deal, new law that came, um, came down from Illinois signed by Governor Pritzker just yesterday. Um, and actually, <laughs> this is even more breaking news, what's happening at the federal level, I'm getting, um, I'm getting like text from my, uh, from my co-chair Annette Timon as we're going through this, uh, as we're going through this webinar, there's a markup session going on right now on the, the um, HR 7, the Paycheck Fairness Act. And Annette is actually listening into the markup session, which is why she's not joining us today. We had to kind of split duties. Um, but she she just texted and said that there, there was an admitted, uh, amendment um, from a representative in Oregon that would include the definition of sex to include both sexual orientation and gender identi identity. It said that the OFCCP, this is a big one, OFCCP and EEOC would have joint enforce, enforcement for the Equal Pay Act. Um, and the hearing is still going on, so there are gonna be more updates, but pay uh, close attention because there are gonna be some major um, action likely at the, at the federal level. So Matt, I wanted to turn it over to you to talk through um, the developments on equal pay litigation. But before I do that, I wanted to read the CLE code. So the CLA code is SS, as in Cypher Shaw, 8392. Again, and this won't be repeated, so if you, if you could, please write it down. So it's SS, is in Cypher Shaw, 8392. So thanks again, um, and over to you, Matt, to talk through the developments in equal pay litigation. All right, thank you, Christine. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about uh, developments in equal pay litigation and uh, amazing to hear that we are once again breaking news live on our webinar. That's pretty rare feat to do. I think I've seen it twice now in these webinars. It's amazing. Um, all right, let's go ahead to the next slide and get started on our, now this is a litigation trend. So here we're talking about developments in law as it relates to more case law developments, as opposed to what Christine was talking about, our legislative developments, both are incredibly important. Um, so one of the things that we have seen um, 
uh, especially as it uh, relates to the laws that Christine was just talking about, um, is, is one, as she mentioned, we're seeing an increase in litigation activity. Uh, the pandemic has, uh, has thrown that a bit into disarray as it has many aspects of our lives, but uh, I will say that the momentum behind equal pay litigation, we have not seen that slack off. Uh, and we continue to believe that momentum is only growing uh, and it's going to become a more and more important issue for employers. Um, now, the tendency, you know, talking about these state law issues, the tendency in those laws is to uh, loosen uh, the standards a bit with respect to bringing one of these types of cases. So, uh, one of the thing that one of the things we see, and especially in California and some of the other more recent laws, uh, is a, a loosening of what counts as equal work. Uh, so in California, you have um, what's called a substantially similar work standard. Um, and we've also seen some important limitations to some of the affirmative defenses that employers can rely on to uh, justify uh, an alleged pay disparity. And why is that important? The more relaxed standards could but we're still watching this, but it could give plaintiffs a better chance at establishing a widespread disparity uh, among a very large class. Uh, and the theory, that theory is being tested right now in a handful of lawsuits uh, around the country, especially California. Probably the most notable example is the case that's still ongoing against Google. Um, it's right now, it's going through its class certification stage uh, and um, it's it's trying to, uh, link together uh, this concept of this uh, relaxed standard with respect to what is equal work with um, some of the other things that we've been talking about today, including, uh, you know, the so called uh, wage gap uh, and the use of salary history as uh, uh, to, to set starting salary. And the theory there is, as Christine mentioned, uh, you know, if you where you start somebody often can determine where they are even 10 years later, especially if you if you make merit increases or other types of increases uh, dependent on a percentage uh, of salary, uh, which many employers do. Uh, the theory is that what this does is just perpetuates a, a pay disparity that sort of exists out in the world. Um, and so uh, what we have seen is some move with some plaintiff's counsels uh, to use uh, that issue as a way as uh, sort of the glue uh, to bind large classes or collective actions of plaintiffs together in one lawsuit. Uh, keeping a close eye on it, it's still a developing thing, but I continue to believe that's one of the most important trends out there right now. All right, why don't we, uh, well, there we go. Uh, another thing I wanna talk about today uh, is the different frameworks for equal pay litigation under Title VII and the Equal Pay Act. It's not exactly a new subject. These laws are, are both decades old, but we have seen in a few instances in the last few years, some uh, courts have taken the opportunity to sort of elucidate the differences between the two statutes. And those differences can be quite significant. They, be, they can be case determinative uh, in many cases. Um, most of the time, uh, yeah, courts will simply note that Title VII pay discrimination lawsuits are to be decided the same way as an Equal Pay Act lawsuit. Um, and they typically will, will, you know, make that case come out the same way under both statutes. It's, it's not always the case. Um, one critical difference, for example, is that Title VII is also often interpreted as having an intent requirement, while the equal pay does not. And what that means in practice is that an Equal Pay Act, uh, the Equal Pay Act is often regarded as being closer to a strict liability standard. You simply measure one person's compensation against another person's compensation of the opposite sex. And if there's a disparity and there's equal work, you know, they're truly equal apples to apples comparison, then there's a violation unless the defendant can establish one of the affirmative defenses that are enumerated in the statute. Uh, there's no need for a plaintiff to prove that the discrimination was intentional um, and the employer can't plead ignorance to those basic facts. If there is a disparity, there's a violation. That's just the way that law is set up. Um, Title VII, you do have to prove some kind of discriminatory animus in a what's called a disparate treatment case, disparate impact cases or adverse impact cases are slightly different, but let's leave those aside for now. Um, it can make a difference. Uh, there have been cases where um, in 
an employee, a plaintiff has not been able to show that there is a comparator out there that they can easily show an apples to apples comparison and that it will be fatal to an equal pay act claim. But if they can show some evidence of discriminatory animus, nevertheless, they may still have a title seven wage uh, disparity claim. Um, all right, let's see here. Both uh, uh, statutes use a burden shifting scheme. Burden shifting is a little bit different in each. And again, this can uh, often lead to uh, different results under the different statutes. Uh, I will say, generally speaking, the Equal Pay Act has uh, been set up to have a slightly higher burden uh, in terms of trying to establish a prima facie case. Uh, and the reason I think for why that is, is that it's set up more as strict liability, a bit higher of a hurdle. Uh, but then the defendants have uh, recourse to only a limited number of affirmative defenses, whereas in Title VII cases, they just have to articulate a non-discriminatory motive for the alleged pay disparity. So it's just slightly different, uh, can, can impact the outcome of cases, and it's something that's being uh, explored uh, quite extensively in recent case law. Okay, let's, oh, there we are. We're going to talk about the prima facie case requirements. Um, so let's talk about establishing a wage disparity. Uh, this is another one of those uh, areas where um, we're seeing some developments in the law. We're seeing some cases come out that are, are attacking that issue head on. Usually, uh, historically, it's often been one of the easier elements to prove. You just measure one salary or our hourly wage against another and which, you know, see which one is higher. It tends to not be that difficult but not the case in a few recent cases. Uh, and this again has been an outcome determinative issue. Uh, how do you measure it? Uh, how, do you, how do you balance it, compare it when you have uh, employees paid different base salaries, but then different commissions, different bonuses? Uh, some plaintiffs have, and, and I will tell you that the EEOC takes the position and many courts have followed uh, that you have to look at total compensation. But then the issue naturally arises, well, if I have to work twice as hard as an employee of the opposite sex uh, to, 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 to get those commissions, to get those bonuses, is that truly equal? Uh, that's an issue that has come up quite frequently recently, and I think that that's going to continue to be uh, an issue that's going to be explored. Um, there is also, uh, and especially when we're talking about this equal work requirement, uh, there's an issue uh, that, that we're looking at with respect to this new uh, initiatives at the state level, uh, perhaps at the federal level as well, uh, on this pay transparency uh, topic, uh, the pay disclosure laws. Uh, and the issue comes up uh, as a, a uh, employer's use of pay grades, classification, hierarchical systems uh, uh, to set salary. Uh, and often you'll, you'll see this come up in two ways. One. Uh, employers will point to that and say, hey, look, the reason why that there is this seeming pay disparity is because that's just where people fit within this hierarchical framework. Um, but on the flip side, plaintiff's counsel or plaintiffs will often point to these sorts of grades and uh, classifications to try to establish that everybody within that uh, classification is doing the same work. It's sort of a proxy to establish that equal work requirement. Uh, uh, the prima facie case, which is uh, often the most, uh, the highest hurdle for a plaintiff's counsel uh, to overcome. Uh, we're still looking at that, seeing it, uh, how that uh, will, will shake out, but it's again, it's a, a trend or an issue or development that we're pointing out because uh, as employers uh, get more used to these uh, auditing and taking a, a sort of a self-critical analysis of their pay practices that lends itself to these sorts of classifications and groupings. When you do that, you have to be sure that you're comparing apples to apples. And I think with these new pay disclosure laws, we're seeing one brand new yesterday in my state. Um, uh, how is that going to uh, how is that going to intersect with this development as all as well? Because those disclosure requirements are often based on categorical groupings. So an important thing to look out for. Um, let's uh, move on to the next slide. Let's see here. Yes, okay. Um, retaliation claims. Uh, these, this slide shows three important developments, sort of uh, uh, offshoots of Equal Pay Act cases that often uh, can determine the outcome of cases and are important in their own right. One is retaliation claims. Um, 
the key obstacle in a retaliation claim is often, and this is reflected in recent case laws, often about timing. Uh, if an alleged retaliatory uh, event happens close in time after the alleged protected activity, uh, just the narrowness of that time frame alone, uh, many courts have held, uh, will establish causation. Um, opposite is also true. If there is a relatively large amount of uh, time gap uh, between those events, or if there's an intervening event, especially that can break that causal link. And that's the sort of thing we've seen a lot of that sort of discussion in the case law recently. Arbitration agreements, of course, are also a hot topic everywhere in employment litigation. Equal pay litigation is, is no uh, exception to that. Uh, the general rule uh, is that most often those agreements are enforced. Uh, several very uh, high profile examples of that recently, the Second Circuit uh, uh, held that uh, um, uh, uh, an employee who had been uh, assigned to work in the United States from India was required to uh, arbitrate uh, his claims under um, an Indian arbitration regime, uh, despite the fact that he argued that, well, that might not, that might deprive me of my rights under US law, including pay discrimination rights under the Equal Pay Act and Title VII. Nevertheless, the, seventh, the Second Circuit uh, held that that should be arbitrated. And that's most often the case. Um, careful drafting is key. A couple recent examples uh, in the case law, and they're spelled out in the book, Developments in Equal Pay Litigation, which was released along with this webinar. Uh, in more detail, but there are some instances where if you do not pay attention to how you're drafting your agreement, uh, there is an avenue there for plaintiffs to escape the arbitration provisions. And then finally, let's talk a little bit about uh, complex employment. This is another issue like arbitration. It's impacting all types of employment litigation. Equal pay litigation is no exception. And what I would like to stress uh, here in the last minute or so is that this can apply to individuals. Uh, there are some recent cases where uh, a director of HR, for example, uh, was held to be a joint employer be due to the power, the control that that person exercised over a particular employee who was uh, bringing an equal pay claim. Uh, and that is a critical issue. I've seen it more times in the last year than I have any time in the last, you know, six or seven years that we've been following this. And um, uh, so we're, we're keeping a close eye on that to see if that's a developing trend. All right, well, that's it. That's uh, please do check out uh, the book for more detail on all of these things. But I think that that uh, concludes our, our, our presentation today. Thank you so much for joining us. Perfect. And I was just going to take a couple of really quick questions um, that, that came in. So the first one is you mentioned that California employers who may have po folks that are sitting remotely but reporting into California offices um, would they need to include them? You asked about the the alternative. So you have an employee sitting in New York um, who is working in California um, remotely in California, but reporting into an office in New York. Do they also need to be included? Um, and the answer is yes, they do need to be included if that's how um, it's um, included in your in your snapshot. So that was a great question. Another question is how what is the 100 employees, is that just Illinois employees or is it a nationwide headcount? Now, the, the, the Illinois law is really complicated. It has many, many provisions. Like it has even things like um, uh, criminal history um, provisions and many, many things. But only talking about that equal pay registration certificate, it says, that for just for that just for that one section, section 11, it says that it only applies to private employers who have more than 100 employees in the state of Illinois. So that's a little bit more limited. And then the last question is, um, what is the you? The last question is on the pay scale disclosure requirements. Does it have to be the theoretical range or the actual range of incumbents? And that's a great question. Um, the laws are a little bit different. They all have a different flavor, um, but I'm going to talk about the Colorado law because it's the most kind of precise around this around this this exact answer. And it says basically that you have to have the reasonable range 
um, that you would pay. So if you have some very high outlier that may have been demoted, for example, and you would never pay anyone else at that at that high range, um, then you wouldn't want to include that that them in that range because it wouldn't be the reasonable range um, for for that for that pay scale. So that's a great um, that's a great question. Um, another question is, should you include partners and people that ha that don't receive a W-2 um, w wages, um, like if they got a K-1 um, under the California pay law? And the answer is no, you just include people that receive W-2 wages um, in, the, in the report. Um, so again, thanks so much. We, we don't want to keep you, but we'll be sharing the slides, but we wanted to answer a few of those questions. Thank you so much for joining us. We're always so thrilled to be with you on Equal Pay Day um, and, and look forward to connecting with you all soon. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Thank you very much for joining us. This concludes our webinar for this afternoon. Have a great day. Thank you.